Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this lecture on Romans chapter 8. Liberation by the Spirit. Romans 8 can be roughly divided into two halves. In the first half, Paul picks up themes he's been developing since Romans 5.12. Namely, how has God intervened in the world to rescue humans who had fallen into sin and become liable to sin and death? It expands the scope to address restoration, even the restoration of the cosmos. The word spirit is used 15 times in the first 17 verses. Paul talks about the spirit as the antidote to the flesh, as God's present and indwelling means of setting things right. At the same time, the language of waiting and even of suffering appears in the latter half of the chapter which is bookended by talk of glory. So you can see ways this picks up the topic of Romans 5, namely the glory of Adam that was lost, the way Christ restored it, recovered it. And Paul is now turning to figure out how through the spirit does God restore the lost glory of Adam to all of creation. In a sense, you could divide this chapter between the already, that is the liberating effects of the Spirit are the already, and the waiting for glory and the present suffering and the present need for hope represent the not yet. Already, Paul will say, the Spirit is active to counteract the flesh. And here he'll pick up on chapter 7, where he's talked about the flesh being the thing that made the law useless. The Spirit will guarantee resurrection. And the Spirit joins those in Christ to the glorified Christ. At the same time, that last verse, verse 17, which speaks of being glorified with Christ, also says we will be glorified with him if we suffer with him. And this introduces the note of waiting and first of present suffering with Christ. And the fact that the same spirit which guarantees resurrection with Christ is also a spirit that presently groans in a sort of agonized expectation, longing to see the glory that is to be revealed to the children of God. In many ways, Paul's challenge here is to say that the spirit is completely adequate to address everything that, that the sin is, has uh, prevented from being solved. That is, everything that's gone wrong in Adam can now be uh, practically instantiated, set right by the indwelling spirit. So he wants to show that this spirit is adequate, but at the same time, not paint a picture that's unrealistic and that'll bear no relationship to what actually goes on in this world. If we look a little more closely at the details and look section by section, We'll see that Paul, as is characteristic of quite a few parts of Romans, offers a inferential therefore. And if you're reading carefully, you can almost feel a change of voice, as if Paul stands up and stretches and says, okay, from Romans 5 to 8, I've been building a new set of themes, and I'm going to pull them together. If you've just come off of Romans 7, this, therefore, is a bit surprising. There is, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why is it surprising? What has Paul just finished saying? He's spoken about how humans are fleshly and therefore are apparently incapable of doing what the law says, even though they want to. He concludes 724, Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He follows that with a sort of uh, anticlimactic summary of the contents of Romans 7, but this is hardly triumphalist. So then, to sum up what I've said in Romans 7, with my mind I'm a slave to the law of God, that is, I approve what the law says, but with my flesh I am a slave to the law of sin. Wah, wah. You can see that it's really hard to go from that 
uh, sort of pessimistic note, I am a slave to the law of sin in my flesh. From that to Romans 8.1, which is the very next verse. And again, there are no verses in Greek. In the original Greek, this would have been written as continuous script. I'm a slave to the law of sin. Therefore, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That feels like a profound non sequitur. In fact, it's tempting to imagine reversing those last two verses of Romans 7. So that first you get a conclusion of the contents of Romans 7. All right, to sum it up, I'm a slave to the law of God in my mind, but in my flesh I'm a slave to sin. Okay, I'm really, really wretched. Who's going to rescue me from this nasty body, which keeps me sinful? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But we're not really allowed to just go willy-nilly reversing the order of uh, the sentences. Which means we're still stuck with this therefore, and we're just trying to read slowly and tarry with things that strike us as puzzling. And sometimes we may conclude there's no satisfying answer, but at times we may say, ah, I see what you're up to, Paul. And I think in this case, Paul is the therefore, Paul uses here, is a therefore drawn from all of Romans 5 through 8. So he's saying, let me look back over the main categories I've just covered. In chapter 5, I spoke of the universal condemnation in Adam. And he uses the same word for condemnation that he used there. This is the first time he's used it since then. So he's saying, the antidote for Adam's condemnation is Christ's righteousness. And in chapter 6, the chief point was to say that believers are truly in Christ, which means just as he died from this realm of sin, so they participate in that death to sin, which means sin becomes this impossibility for them at some level. Because they are in Christ, there can't be any condemnation. Christ has died to sin once for all. So I think the therefore is saying, chapter 5, condemnation is done. Chapter 6, those who are in Christ, you are in Christ. And then, verse 1, having sort of recapitulated chapters 5 and 6, verse 2 turns to the contents of Romans 7. The law that Paul says, in Romans 7, Paul says, I see a different law in my members. He sees this unruly inclination to sin, such that even a good law sent by God is hopeless behind enemy lines, that is, in the world. So what has God done? And here Paul, I think, indulges in a play on words. If he sees this principle of sin in his flesh, which he calls the law of sin, then the law of the Spirit of life in Christ sets you free from the law of sin and death. There's all the vocabulary from Romans 7 picked up. How will God deal with this problem that even the good law of Moses was hopelessly overpowered to deal with? God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. Because of people's flesh, the law couldn't get anywhere. So God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering or to deal with flesh and condemned sin in the flesh. There was condemnation. God went and condemned that condemnation so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. We can look in a bit more detail at Romans 8.3, because I just want to note that in 8.3, what the NRSV has translated as, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, that expression, and to deal with sin, is the Greek peri hamartias, quite literally, 
concerning sin or about sin. And that happens to be the standard Greek expression for a sin offering in the Greek Old Testament. So in the Greek Bible that Paul used and that most Jews used, every time Leviticus said something like, the priest shall perform the sin offering, what the Greek literally said was, the priest shall perform the concerning sin, or the about sin. It's a bit of a funny expression. It would have sounded odd in Greek. But this was the standard Greek collocation for the sin offering, which means I think you could translate this passage in Romans 8.3 Paul, as Paul saying, God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering, and he condemned thereby sin in the flesh. He's using a bit more sacrificial imagery from the Old Testament. That's the point I want to make here with this expression, peri hamartias. There's one other detail I want to look at in Romans 8, 1 to 4, and then we'll move a bit more briskly. But this other detail is that in Romans 8, 4, Paul says, so that the just requirement, and the Greek there is dikaioma, so that the just requirement of the law might be, might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. You'll see that the root of dikaioma is the same as dikaiosune. So it's something like justice. The NRSV renders it the just requirement. Well, if you've been reading in Greek, you will have seen this word before. And that's back in Romans 2, when Paul is talking about what constitutes the true Jew. Quick recap, in Romans 2, Paul's making the point that Gentiles are all condemned and that Jews, although they have the law, aren't in any better shape because having the law doesn't do anything. It's only doing the law that matters. And he pauses there to say, even the uncircumcised, the Gentiles, if they keep the dikaiomata, the just requirements of the law, won't their uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? The Greek word is actually, won't it be reckoned as circumcision? It's that it's the same word as God reckoning Abraham's faith for justice. Now, here's why we're pausing with this word, is that Paul had raised the question back in Romans 2. It seems like mainly to show simply that the Jews, by having the law, aren't thereby justified. Because theoretically, you could imagine Gentiles doing everything God wanted, and surely God would count that above a Jew who had the law but didn't do it. We take your point, Paul. But it was unclear if he was talking about any real Gentiles who did the things the law required. Here when we get to Romans 8.4, Paul is clearly saying, folks with the Spirit successfully have the law fulfilled in them. And you wonder if he's trying to address his problem of the law by saying Christians do fulfill the law. They fulfill what it really wants. They fulfill its dikaioma. He'll certainly say something similar in Romans 13, 8. The one who loves another has fulfilled the law because all the commandments, don't murder, uh, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't covet, and any other commandment you can think of, they're all summed up in the word, love your neighbor. Therefore, if you love your neighbor, you are fulfilling the law. So Paul here seems to speak of the law as fulfillable. You can fulfill it by walking according to the Spirit. You can fulfill it by loving your neighbor. What's, that, that much seems relatively clear. It will leave open a few questions, which are addressed explicitly in the lecture on Paul and the law. One of the questions will be in Romans 14 and 15. Paul is addressing certain believers who are concerned about the specific commandments in the law, like about the food laws. And Paul calls the people who are concerned about the food laws weak in faith. 
But you can imagine them saying, why am I weak in faith? I'm fulfilling the law by loving my neighbor and by observing the particular commandments God has given. I'm doing it by the power of the Spirit. Right? The, the other reason I want to just dwell on this question, the main verse we're worried about is Romans 8, 4. Is Paul claiming that believers with the Spirit fulfill the law? This takes us back to a passage in Romans 2 I just want to revisit briefly. And that is where he talks about Gentiles who do the law and will be justified. He says when it's the doers of the law who will be justified, and when Gentiles who do not possess the law do by nature the things of the law, then even though they don't have the law, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. Now, he doesn't say anything about the Holy Spirit in Romans 2. But this talk of having the, the law written on their hearts sure sounds like he's got the Spirit in mind. Because the prophecy of Jeremiah 31, that a day would come when God would give everyone a new spirit, says explicitly, I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. Ezekiel 36, verse 26 and 27 says the same thing. Here's why I'm dwelling on this. Romans 2, 25 to 29 redefines the Jew and says it's the person who does what the law wants that is the true Jew. That's going to be something we have to keep in mind when we get to the next chapter, to Romans 9, where Paul is saying, has God kept his promises to the Jews? Because one thing he's going to do is say, well, what if we redefine, redefine what Jew means? It's not the only thing he'll do in Romans 9. So just bear in mind that here in Romans 2, Paul, is Paul already in Romans 2 talking about Gentile believers who have the Holy Spirit. And that's why, even though they don't have the law, they do the things the law requires. If that is what Paul is doing back in Romans 2, you can see why it's confusing. Because Romans 2 and 3 build up to this climactic claim in Romans 3, therefore there is no justification on the basis of works of the law. But if Paul in Romans 2 is already talking about some Gentiles who have the Spirit, have the law written on their hearts, do the things commanded by the law, and it's the doers of the law who are justified, how can he draw the conclusion in Romans 3.20, there's no justification by works of the law? The logical, just, the logical conclusion, if he's already talking about people who have the Spirit in Romans 2, the logical conclusion would be, therefore, there is no justification on the basis of works of the law unless you've got the power of the Holy Spirit which writes the law on your heart and helps you do it. So it would seem that Paul has set up a scenario whereby uh, originally there was a problem. You have a mind and you have flesh. You have a good commandment from God, thou shalt not covet. The mind likes it, the flesh can't abide. So you fail. You're under sin, condemnation, death. Praise be to God in Jesus Christ. You now can walk according to the Spirit, which means you've crucified the flesh. Those in Christ have crucified the flesh, Galatians 5.24. The flesh, the bad ingredient, is out of the picture. The Spirit's now empowering that good and spiritual commandment, Romans 7.14, the law is spiritual as well as holy, righteous, and good, means that the mind that always liked it can now perfectly walk according to it. Therefore, those of us who keep in step with the Spirit, in us, the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled. All right, sounds like everything is all set. Is there anything less, even left for Paul to instruct? Like if, if you actually, you know, remove um, like a certain biological problem from your body, you don't have to concentrate on not having pneumonia anymore. Once that, that bug is out of your system, you just don't have pneumonia. So the flesh has been crucified, You've got the spirit, you're just healthy, and you just do what the law commands. Not so fast. Not so fast, according to Romans 8. Paul still speaks of the flesh as an ongoing potential problem 
And Romans 8, 5 through 15 are, in my view, honestly, a little confusing. It's easier to see a tension Paul's trying to hold than to unpack his explanation with precise logic. So he says in Romans 8, 5, those who live according to the flesh, so it's still this ongoing possibility, they set their mind on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their mind on the things of the spirit. The mind on the flesh is death. The mind on the spirit is life and peace. So a fleshly mind, a mind set on the flesh, is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Somewhat confusingly, Paul vacillates in this section between doing things according to the spirit or the flesh and being in the spirit or the flesh. He will consistently say that believers are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. But he'll also say you mustn't live or think according to the flesh. So the flesh still seems to be an ongoing potential problem, which could lead to a mind which is hostile to God and hostile to the commandment. Paul changes the image in the following verses, and he says, you are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. So here he stops speaking of the mind or the mental attitude and speaks of God's spirit. This sounds like transfer language. You used to be in the flesh, this bad realm, prior to your coming to Christ. Now you're in the spirit. But it's not that simple, because even in the spirit, there's some lingering power of flesh, which is also sort of spoken of as the power of the body. So Paul continues in Romans 8.10. If Christ is in you, so he interchanges the language of the spirit in you, or Christ in you, then although the body is dead because of sin, that's really difficult language, because now he's switched from flesh, which sounds like a force, like an evil inclination, to speaking of body. Does that mean physical bodies, that they die? And why is there still sin? Why is the body dead because of sin? After all, he says, you died to sin because you're in Christ and Christ died to sin. This is just hard language if you try to parse it out phrase by phrase. What, what coherent system is Paul describing? Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, so now the spirit is being called the spirit of God, the spirit of the one who raised Christ, then he who raised Christ will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit which dwells in you. So your body is dead because of sin, and you have to be careful not to live according to the flesh, but you're not in the flesh. So you have flesh, but you're not in flesh. You have a body that will is mortal and has to uh, be mortified, but the spirit of God who raised Christ from the dead will even give life to your mortal bodies, which are dead because of sin. So Paul concludes in Romans 8, 12. And here's the reminder that he doesn't think, despite all his um, already language, he doesn't think everything has been achieved. Therefore, brethren, we are indebted not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. That means eschatologically. He doesn't just mean you'll die. He knows everyone dies. He means if you walk according to the flesh, you will reap from the flesh destruction, eternal destruction. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So here Paul spells out, you reap what you sow. He says the same thing in Galatians 6. God will pay everyone back according to their deeds. Why is this not simply tit for tat? Well, because it is the spirit, it is God's spirit that you're plugging into that gives you the power to mortify the deeds of the body so that you will live. So it is God's work from beginning to end. But that doesn't mean there mustn't still be an actual evidence of the power of the spirit. So again, to stick with this little uh, outlet metaphor that I've given visually here, 
If the light bulb doesn't turn on, you are not plugged into the outlet. The light bulb turning on is righteous effects in the person's life, mortifying the deeds of the body. Paul goes on to give an even more positive assessment of things. So while he's raised the specter of failing to adequately walk by the Spirit, to choose spirit over flesh, he insists that everyone who is led by the Spirit is a child of God. Now, someone could say, how do I know that I'm a child of God? And I think Paul's argumentation here is quite remarkable and gives a prominence to something we would call religious experience. So let's follow follow Paul's logic in Romans 8, 14 to 17. This is very much like his logic in Galatians. We who are led by the Spirit are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received a spirit of adoption or a spirit of sonship. Which is to say, the spirit you got is characterized by being a spirit of childness. How so, Paul? He says, well, when we cry, Abba, Father, so he appeals there to an actual concrete religious experience that he takes for granted they experience. And notice that he says, Abba. He uses an Aramaic word. So when when they're filled with the spirit and they cry out in a language that's not even their native tongue, He says, that is what Christ said to God. Christ is clearly God's child. Christ is the Son of God. Which means, when we say Abba Father, that is Christ's spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. In other words, and this is where it gets a little trippy and gets quasi-Trinitarian, When you say Abba Father, it's not you talking. It's Christ's Spirit speaking those words through you. So the same voice, the Spirit of Christ which utters to God, you are my Father, is speaking through you. And that's the sense in which the Spirit testifies to you, to your Spirit, that you are children in the same way Christ is a child of God. That's quite remarkable, and he'll say a bit more about that with this language of prayer in the Spirit and groans too deep for words momentarily. The idea seems to be that there's a conversation already happening within the persons of God, and that when people pray, they don't always know what they ought to pray, but it's the Spirit helping. We don't know how we ought to pray. The Spirit intercedes with groans too deep for words. That is, the human groaning, longing for redemption, is an echo of the Spirit's groaning. God who searches the heart knows what is in the mind, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This seems to suggest that the intercession of the Spirit to God takes place through the mouths of Christians in ecstatic prayer, when they groan and speak with things too deep for words as if to bring Christians into this life of the Trinity, this conversation between Spirit and Father occurs with Christians as the mouthpiece. You get similar ideas in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, where Paul contrasts praying with the Spirit and praying with the mind. And I think the article from Sarah Coakley on prayer and the Spirit is an absolutely sparkling example of careful theological interrogation of this concept, where she makes it clear this can't be a technique or a trick. In some sense, all all prayer is in the spirit by definition. At the same time, there seems to be something, we don't want to sort of cook this down to being nothing more than a theological datum. There's something experiential. And she also notes that, well, for the most part, Paul speaks of this as a reassuring thing, It's it's the testimony of the Spirit that confirms that people are children of God. There's also an agony here, a groaning. And the same Spirit that drove Christ into the wilderness, the same Spirit with which Christ said, My Father, why have you forsaken me? May be the Spirit that speaks through uh, believers as they groan, as they suffer. So this isn't triumphalistic. If you've got the Spirit, everything will be happy and easy. 
and yet it, it keeps open the possibility of something like ecstatic experience. If we go back just a couple of verses, we can see that it makes a subtle shift and says, therefore we are heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. Nothing can be more positive than that. Everything Christ has inherited, will inherit, we will inherit because we're in Christ. We have the same spirit. If in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. So he's usually quite insistent that anyone in Christ will share Christ's destiny of glorification, of the regained image of, uh, of Adam. But here he introduces this note of suffering. And it's as if to say, just as Christ suffered, so believers, so those joined to Christ, will share in Christ's suffering. In fact, they must. And in a stunning passage, Paul links the suffering that believers experience with the suffering of the whole world. So he says, now I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed. Why? Because all of creation, he, he actually first makes the problem worse, all of creation waits with eager longing for the revelation of the children of God. That is to say, this whole world is in some grief because the image of God isn't dwelling within her. Like an expectant mother, she groans in labor pains, longing to see the children of God become what they were meant to be, to see God's image dwell within her. Why? Why is this? Why is the, what, what's the reason for the sad state of affairs? Creation was subject to futility. And there he uses the word vanity, subject to meaninglessness. It's the word used so often in the book of Ecclesiastes. What a remarkable thing. Ecclesiastes is a book that hardly shows up in the New Testament. It doesn't get alluded to. It doesn't get quoted. And you sort of wonder, where did this great gem from the Old Testament, which tells it like it is, things are meaningless, things don't work the way they should, why didn't that get picked up in New Testament theology? Well, here it does, very briefly, as Paul says, this cosmos is subject to futility. Solomon was right. It got subject to futility by God. God's the one who sort of broke his own creation. God subjected it, but he subjected it in hope. So creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay. Creation has a slavery that is the slavery of, of ruin, of decay. And creation will also obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So creation is like this expectant mother too far along in the pregnancy, groaning, could I please just give birth? And Paul says, uh, therefore, creation awaits the redemption, not only of creation, but of us who have the first fruits of the Spirit who also groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. In other words, humans' physical bodies are subject to the same futility and decay as the rest of creation. And God's Spirit is the voice groaning and saying, it's not supposed to be like this, waiting for the redemption of the body. This talk of the groaning and suffering of the world, this sense of the not yet, leads Paul to return to talk of hope. Hope that is seen is not hope. Who hopes for what is seen? That is, it hasn't happened yet. That's why there's a need for hope. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with endurance. Where have you heard that language before? Well, remember that I said the first paragraph of Romans 5 plants the seeds which Paul harvests in Romans 8. And in Romans 5, we get a set of topics, a set of vocabulary that we haven't encountered yet in Romans that appear again here in Romans 8. We boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, we boast of our sufferings. Also a new idea so far in Romans, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope. Paul now returns to those themes as he concludes this second major movement of the letter, that is Romans 5 to 8. Quite a remarkable feat, actually, when dictating a letter. 
And Paul goes from here, this, this note that we, we wait and hope, we groan, things haven't yet happened, to a sort of doxological conclusion. All things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And now he introduces a note of calling and election. And that's going to prepare the way for Romans 9 to 11, where he speaks about the calling and election of Israel. For those whom God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. What language should we expect with that? Image, the recovered glory of Adam. The image of God is now meant to dwell on earth in order that his son, that is Christ, might be the firstborn among many brethren. Those whom he predestined for this, he called. Those whom he called, he justified. Those whom he justified, he glorified. Here Paul steps back. The tenses are spoken as if from eternity. The whole plan will come to fruition. And that leads Paul to wax uh, eloquent for a moment and say, what should we say about these things? If God is for us, if this whole plan is bound to be achieved, who is against us? And again, he comes back to saying the surest thing humans have to cling to as evidence, as a ground for their hope. What did he say in Romans 5? What's the reason for thinking hope is not just foolishness? Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts because God didn't spare his son. Romans 8.32 recapitulates. God who did not withhold his own son but gave him up for all of us, will he not also give us everything? This means we're safe from any charge. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who's left to condemn? There's no serious adversary. Everything is in God's hands. It's Christ who died, yes, who was raised, is at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us. Paul brings together yet another thread, that of intercession. Christ's spirit intercedes. Christ intercedes with the Father. Christ's spirit intercedes with the Father through human mouths. Who will separate anyone from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Neither death nor life, angels nor rulers, things present or things to come, powers, height, depth, anything else in all creation will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here ends movement two, the second big section of Paul's letter to the Romans. He's now covered a sort of theoretical approach to his doctrine of justification. He spelled out how that looks in real life, noting that on the one hand, his, his theory sounds quite triumphalistic. If you died with Christ to death, to sin, then you live. The, the sin's an impossibility. You're bound to be glorified. On the other hand, he knows that's not what life looks like, and so he addresses the fact that even creation is subject to futility. Both we and creation long together for the redemption of our bodies, and the guarantee, the down payment on what's to come is the Spirit, and the fact that it, on the one hand, testifies of the Father, is a guarantee that we're children of God. On the other hand, that it testifies that it groans and moans and is in agony, reminds us that the culmination of all these things has not yet happened.